So I'm going to be demoing uh, some HTML5 features today. My goal is to, uh, I don't have any slides. My goal is to just create demos on the fly. I have, I have notes. I didn't come unprepared. Um, <laughs> and actually show them running in browsers. Um, uh, part of my goal here is to not use the future tense because uh, I want to show that things actually are happening today. Um, however, I should warn you that all of the browsers I'm going to show you are basically betas and unreleased nightly builds and stuff like that. All right, so first I'm going to demo um, the video element in HTML5. We added this element so we could uh, show videos, much like you would see on YouTube, for example. So uh, imagine you have this page here, uh, just a normal blank HTML page. Oops, hang on, let me reconnect my server. There we go. All right, so I'm going to uh, embed a video. So we use the video element. Uh, and we give the source attribute, just like with an image element, and we'd say the name of the video. So here I have an og Fiora video, like that. And then, uh, by the way, for people on, who are watching this on YouTube and can't read what I'm typing on a screen, all the demos are up at this URL, or will be by the end of the talk. That's where I'm putting them up. Um, but anyway, so we have, we have this, uh, with this video here, so let's go have a look to see what it looks like. Uh, it's that URL. So there's our video. Now it's not playing because we haven't told it to play. And we have two choices here. We can either type in our own uh, JavaScript controls and hook it all up using script, or we can just put the controls attribute on the element. And then, ta-da, we have a play control. So now we can press play and it'll start playing video. He's been trying to customize his web browser. This will make it go faster. <laughs> um, now, you'll notice that when I loaded the page, it didn't start playing. It had a play button. But we can add the autoplay attribute. And now, if I reload the page, it'll play automatically. For years, Billy's been trying to customize his web browser. Um, now, like I said, we can also do, the, do this using JavaScript. So let's see. Let's, let's add some JavaScript. Uh, first of all, we'll add a script element. Note that in HTML5, uh, you don't have to put the type attribute here. You can just say script, and it'll assume it's JavaScript. Um, so we could say script, and then we can get uh, the video element um, using the regular old way of picking the first video element in the file. Um, and then here we want some input controls. So we can have an input element. Let's put this in a paragraph so it's not on the same line as the video. Uh, input type equals button. Uh, let's see, we want a uh, this is the uh, the stop button, so let's add a, a little square that's that's this particular Unicode character which I prepared earlier. <laughs> um, and then on click is very simple, video dot pause. So now we play this. For years, we have a stop button at the bottom. Trying to customize his web browser. But we still have the controls up here too. This will make it go faster. We can get rid of the controls by just getting rid of the controls element, uh, controls attribute here. There we go. All right, so that's the stop button. Now, how about a play button? That's something that says play. And then we can use a Unicode character 25B6 for a little play button. Um, for years, Billy's been trying to customize his web browser. Now we have a stop and a play. This will make it go faster. Um, now, we can also replace both of these buttons with one button if we just wanted a pause instead of a, a, a stop and a play. So let's see. That would be, uh, let's see. We only need one button now. And we would just say, uh, if video.paused, then video.play, else video.pause. Pretty simple. And then, uh, let's see. We want little. That should look like a pause button. There we go. For years, Billy's been trying to customize his web browser. It. This will make it go oh, faster. Oh, that didn't work. What did they do wrong? Let's see. After many fruitless trials, Billy almost gave up on his dream ah, of a better browser. Ah, missing semicolon. Ta-da. Then he discovered Firefox, secure. All right, so let's see. Um, let's try that again. 
For years, Billy's been trying Ooh. to customize his web browser. See, play stop, play stop. Unfortunately, there's a bug in uh, uh, Firefox, which means that if uh, you reload the page, uh, this is a known bug, and they've already got the patch fixed for it, but there's a bug that you just saw there that is, if you reload the page while the video is playing, it'll keep playing for 15 seconds in the background, but you weren't supposed to see that. Um, <laughs> so that, that was video. So video is a, a nice, simple element. Um, as you can see, the API is pretty uh, obvious. There's nothing really to catch you out there. Um, so that's, that's video. Let's, uh, let's have a look at something else now. Let's look at... Uh, Post message. So uh, imagine we have uh, a gadget and a, and a kind of a, a gadget host. Like Google, Google, iGoogle is a gadget host, and then we have gadgets. Um, so uh, if, if we imagine we have um, a file that contains a gadget, for example, we're using an iframe, um, we can have, uh, let's see, I have an iframe ready on another site to show you that it, this is cross-domain. There we go. OK, so now let's have a look at how this works. Um, we want uh, gadget host, host.html. So here we have um, uh, the gadget host, and then it has an iframe, and apparently I mistyped the URL because that's not what I was expecting to see in there. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Background. Ah, missed the directory. There we go. So now I should say gadget. There we go. Okay, so, so that's all very well. What if the outside frame up here had uh, a little um, form control? Form control. Uh, and it said, let's say, uh, ask for your nickname using an input control. Uh, type equals text, name equals Nick. Um, so now we have a Nick control. Now, nickname control. Now, the, that's all very well. So we can you know, say our nickname is Jack or whatever. But what if the gadget wants to, to know about it? Now, right now in HTML, like as it's shipped today, there's not really any way to talk to the gadget except using weird hacks using the fragment identifier and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so one of the things that HTML5 adds is post message. Um, and so what we can do here is we can say, uh, when you change this value, uh, update the nick, oops, update the nick, we're using the value. The value is the value attribute of the input element. And then if we add a script element, we can put in a little function in here, update Nick. And then what it wants to do is post the message straight to the iframe. Uh, and so we can take the iframe using frame 0. That's the iframe, the first frame in the page. And then we just call post message on, on, the, on the iframe. Uh, and we can give it a message, say Nick equals, and then the value of Nick. Uh, and then for security, we have to make sure we're posting to the right frame. Now, um, there is a way you can just say post to any frame. That's the wildcard. Uh, but that's generally insecure, because what happens if some other page has embedded you and has tricked you into sending this message, but like the message contains a password, say? Well, if the message contains a password and you're posting it to this frame, you had better be sending it to the right frame. Uh, if you send it to some other site, like evil.com, that's you know, been embedded in there to trick you to sending it there, uh, then some random site can get your password. So what we can do instead is we can take the URL that we expect to have, and then we can just paste it in there. Um, and then the message will be dropped on the floor if the URL doesn't match what we're expecting. Um, so that's all very well. We have this now, and we can type uh, you know, nicks and everything. Uh, but nothing's being done in the gadget to expect this. So it doesn't make a very compelling demo. So we can add something to the gadget. Uh, let's see. This is the gadget, very simple HTML page. Um, if we add something in here, we could say, like, have it say, hello, sir, let's see, as a default. Uh, and then have a script. And then this script is where we're going to receive the message. So we use add event listener, which is part of DOM2 HTML, DOM2 event, sorry. Um, 
and we expect a message event. And that event will be fired every time a post message call is invoked on the window. So here's our event handler. Uh, and what we're doing here is look, first of all, we have to check the, the opposite problem, the, the security problem I mentioned earlier, the opposite problem. What if you're getting a message uh, and it's a message that will make you do something, but you're receiving it from someone who isn't who you expect to receive it from? So you can check the origin. So here we make sure that the origin is uh, the host that we're using. Now here we're using www.whatwg.org, so we'll type that in here, wg.org. Uh, and we want to make sure that we have the right message, so we can check e.data, that's where the actual message will be. Uh, and we want to check that the first five characters are uh, nick equals. So we can just te test that, nick equals, there we go. Um, and then if those two conditions are matched, well, we do the very simple, you know, document dot get element by ID, we get the span element that we created up there, uh, and we take its first child, the text node, and we set its data to uh, the nick, which if we do that, we'll get nick equals then the nick, but if we want the actual nick, we just take a substring of the, from the fifth character, uh, from the sixth character, rather, which is five, because it's zero based. Um, so now, if we reload this, we should see that if I type, oh, that didn't work, why didn't that work? We forget to do something here. Let's see, the paragraph isn't appearing for some reason. That would suggest that that's the wrong URL. Oh, let's try that in another browser. It's always the good way of solving this problem. There we go. <coughs> um, this is conveniently going to demo the fact that this also works in another browser. So if we type in stuff here, you'll see that it works great. Um, for some reason, every time I try and type in the nickname into the field called Nick, I come up with Nicholas. I'm not sure why. Um, but you know, so we're typing messages here, and what's what you're seeing here is it's actually going into uh, a message is being sent into a page running on a completely different domain. It, the, the, the gadget there is running on demaumau.com, which is completely different from what wg.org. They don't even share any part of their host name is different, so you couldn't even couldn't even use dot domain to make them uh, the same. Um, now this works in Safari, as I just demoed. Uh, it should work in Firefox, although I'm not entirely sure why it's not. Yeah, maybe that's what's going on there. Let's see, reload iframe. Ah, there we go. Okay, so now if we type in, yeah, it's still not working. I'm not sure why. My error console. Not enough arguments on line 13. Oh, right. <laughs> Add event listen takes three arguments. Um, let's try that again. Make sure we reload the iframe. There we go. Okay, so that works in two different browsers. Um, so there we go, see HTML5 is working in two different browsers. Um, it actually works in three different browsers, but there's a small problem. Uh, add event listener is part of DOM2 events, like I said. Unfortunately, IE doesn't support DOM2 events, but we can hack IE support in by creating window.add event listener on the fly. Uh, see, like I said, it takes three arguments, not two. The first one is the name of the event, the second one is the function, and the third one is whether to be capture, do, do, do capture or not. Uh, and then we translate that to IE's on event, uh, attach event thing, and we pass a function. There we go. So that should, in theory, now work in IE as well. Let's see if that works in IE. See, we want uh, that URL. Oops. Yay. Yay! Three browsers. All right. Can you post to the parent? Yes, you can post to the parent as well. Uh, to post to the parent, you just do um, parent.post message. Um, you can also do this using window.open if you have two completely different windows. Basically, any window, any window um, object has a post message, and if you call it, it'll fire a message event on that, um, on that object. Can you pass objects? You cannot currently pass objects. Um, it's been requested multiple times, and we're looking at that. Part of the problem with passing objects is, so we could pass something that you know, is JSON serializable. 
uh, and that's probably what we'll do. The problem with passing arbitrary objects is the whole problem here is it's cross-origin, and if you pass objects, you end up with all kinds of crazy stuff like passing scripts and all getters and setters that are evil and stuff like that. Um, all right, so that's, uh, that was post message. Let's see, uh, there's something called local storage, which is a little bit like cookies. Um, so let's see, do I have, uh, all right. So let's pretend we're creating a text editor. I'm sure no one in this room has ever created a text editor in HTML. Um, so let's, let's start with a simple form. And then in there, we'll just stick a text area. Um, text area. All right, so it's a very simple page. Um, let's see. So it's just a regular text editor. Nothing too surprising there. Um, that's worked for about a decade now. Um, <laughs> however, let's start adding new stuff. So say you wanted, say you wanted to save and open uh, files, but you didn't want to send them back to the server. You want to save them locally. Um, you could do that today using cookies to some extent. Uh, cookies are really awkward to work with for this kind of stuff. Uh, there's a risk that they'll be sent along with the HTTP uh, message. You don't want to send all your documents over HTTP. Um, and they're also um, uh, limited in, in size and number uh, in ways that um, would be kind of awkward to change. Um, so instead, what we're going to do is use uh, local storage, which is a feature in HTML5. In HTML5. Um, so let's add a file name control. So now we have a file name control. And then let's add uh, an input button um, to open. So that will call a method we'll define in a second called open. And it will use the, uh, the file name. And then we have, we can do another one for saving. And now we need to define the scripts. Now this, this is a, I mean, so far it's simple. It's just a, a, a two buttons, but we need a script to do this. So let's define saving first. How would you save? Well, first we need the file name. Uh, and we can use, uh, because these are form controls, we can use the normal way of accessing um, form control values from the forms object on, on the document object. Uh, and we named the form editor up here, you'll notice. Uh, so we can do forms.editor. Uh, and then we can get the file name straight out because the input control uh, has the name file name. Um, so we can just do editor.filename. And then we can get its value by doing dot value. So this is how you get the file name out of the control. Again, that's nothing too surprising. That's been in HTML for a while. Um, and we can do the same with getting the data out. Document.forms.editor data dot value, because that's the name of our text area, I think. Yep. Um, and now the one liner that actually saves the data uh, is you get the local storage object, and you call set item on it. And set item takes two, two uh, parameters, two arguments. It takes uh, a, f a key, and it takes a value. Uh, the key here, I've decided to use file dash so that we can also use local storage for storing settings and all kinds of stuff. Uh, you can basically call the key whatever you like. Uh, so here we, that saves the data. And then to get the data back out is pretty much the exact opposite. Um, we'll get the file name, and then we'll just say that uh, document.forms.editor.data.value equals local storage got get item, and then file file name. And that's all there is to it. Um, so, yes, I do. Good call. Thank you. Um, all right, let's see. So say we wanted to say hello world, and we wanted to save that in uh, first.txt. Save. There we go. Now we could open, say, earlier.txt. And that has nothing in it, because we didn't put anything there. But we can type in something. 
can save that, and then we can reopen first.txt. Oh, look, there you go, earlier.txt. Ta-da! Um, now, this is the more surprising part of this demo. Oops. Wrong key. Let's try that again. Uh, edit HTML. Uh, IE supports this. Um, <laughs> that surprises me. I don't know about you guys. Um, <laughs> so uh, local storage is interesting. Uh, local storage uh, stores the data uh, client side, and it stores it in all windows at once. Um, let's say we have uh, a wizard, um, and on this wizard we have a form. And what we're going to have here is we have a wizard, and it has three pages. And on each page, you give data. And on the final page, you hit next. And then it loads up a fourth page. And the fourth page uses the data you took from the first three pages to create a form. Well, that's easy to do with CGI script. But we want to do it completely client side, um, except the pages are served by the server, obviously, but the, no script on the server side. Uh, and we can do this using local storage. You can just store the data um, locally on each page. And then we can, uh, on the final page, use document.write or something to output the data. Um, so let's create uh, the first page of what I just described. So um, we want a form. Uh, in the form, we want um, a, a field, a text field. Um, let's just make it a normal text field. Um, and then we want a button that goes onto the next page. So it submits the uh, it's a submit button. Um, and then we want to make this form submit it to page two, step two.html. This is step one.html. Uh, and we can use post so we don't get all the stuff in the URL field. Um, so that's all very well, but it's not actually going to save any data uh, on the client side. So we can use on submit on the form, which has existed for some time to save the data. And we can save n1. n1 is the first uh, input control here. And then in the script, uh, we can just have a save method that takes uh, the element. And then it will just store the data in local storage, like we just did a few minutes ago. Um, let's see, element.name, element.value. Very simple. Uh, so now let's uh, let's demo this. Um, oops. Step one. Okay. So let's say uh, we have three things, and then on the final page, uh, ooh, that was not good. Um, ah, yes. I forgot one thing. So I, like I said, I actually created step two and step three uh, earlier. Um, but one thing that I forgot to do is that step two and step three are expecting the script, uh, which I just wrote, to exist in an external script file, uh, <laughs> which I didn't create. So let's do that. Um, there we go. So the, the external script file is just that. And then instead of uh, doing that, we can just stick everything in a script file that way. Um, so let's try that again, shall we? Step one, HTML. So now it should, assuming that it's not cached. There we go. Um, and this, is, this page is very simple. This page is literally just doing document.write um, with local storage in one, in two, and in three. Um, now the problem is this. Imagine I have two of these. Oops. Uh, and I go to step one in each. Uh, and I type in, you know, I type something on, on the, this one. Uh, and then I type something on in this one. Uh, 
Now, what I typed in the first one uh, were the three words date, ugly, and insult, uh, which should appear in the output. And then what I typed on this one are volume down and geezer. And if you hit next here and then hit next here, uh, it works fine. But if we hit next on that one second, um, you'll see that the message there ended up being corrupted with, message, with text from this one. Um, and that's no good. In fact, that's somewhat annoying. And a few years ago, I was trying to buy plane tickets um, and ended up with exactly this problem in a much more serious way, which is I, was, I had two completely separate windows open, and I was busy buying tickets in one and looking for tickets in another. And I was like, OK, which one's the best ticket? OK, I want to buy that one, click Submit. But of course, I changed that page last. And so that one is a ticket that nearly got bought, um, which is somewhat more serious than you know, some mad libs here. Um, but in HTML5, we have a very simple solution to this, which is we can, instead of using local storage, use session storage. Uh, and we can do the same in the last page, the, the final page here. Use session storage instead of local storage. Um, and now if we try this, make sure to reload the page. Um, uh, let's see. So we'll, let's put in the three things here. And then put three things on this one. Now, if I hit um, next on this page here, everything should work because the values that were most recently set were this one. And on this one, if we'd done this on the, uh, in the previous way, it would now be you know, mixing the words up. However, because we use session storage, they're different. Success. Um, this also works in theory in Firefox. Um, you can type in three things here. Aha. Um, and then we might even work in IE. Let's try that. Oops, we want the first step first. Um, So that's three browsers that worked in. <coughs> All right, now let's see. The next one is going to be about drag and drop. Um, Sorry. Yes, question. For local storage, um, what, what is the security measure? Is it, is it by domain? Yes, uh, local storage is all by domain. Um, a session storage is by um, session, which is actually basically by, by tab. Um, the spec says that if you like open a page from open a new tab from a tab, it should clone the session storage. So you end up with you still have the old data, but then from that point on, they live separately. Uh, the lifetime of session data of session storage rather is whatever um, the browser thinks is a session. Um, so typically, lifetime of the browser um, or lifetime of that window. Uh, the lifetime of local storage is uh, indefinite or until the user clears cookies, whichever comes first. Um, they're basically uh, lifetime cookies, except they're much, there's a much simpler API, and they don't get sent over the network. Um, and hopefully, the limits will be uh, more large initially. All right, so <clears throat> my next demo is going to be uh, drag and drop. Um, so I have three images that I have set up here. Um, I have an image of a can of spam. Uh, always put your alt attributes. Um, I have an image of uh, a bird sitting on an egg. And then I have an image of uh, a cat. I remember if the cat is a GIF or a PNG. Let's hope it's a PNG. Um, let's see. All right, 
those cats, those images are a bit big, but they have a can of spam, an egg, and a cat. Let's make the images a bit smaller. Again, style doesn't need a type attribute in HTML5. It'll assume it's CSS, uh, which should make authoring a bit easier. All right, much better. So we have three images. Um, we can drag them, but actually what, uh, so let's close this window. What's actually happening when we drag them um, is it's trying to drag uh, the image for selection. So I can type in there and actually type in the URL, or if I, in Firefox, I can drag the image, I believe to the, no, I can't drag it to the page, but I can drag it to like tabs and it'll actually open a new tab with that image and stuff like that. Um, much the same way that you can drag text. Now, let's, um, let's uh, create somewhere to drag these two. Um, so let's say we have two divs, and in each div we have, one of them is the good div, and one of them will be the bad div. Let's do that. And then let's uh, style these divs so that they look like drop targets of a kind. Let's see, let's give them some margins. Uh, let's give them a black border. Uh, let's center the text in them. Uh, oh, and give them a height and width as well. and we'll float them to put them side by side. So there we go. Oh, we should put the images on their own line. There we go. OK. Um, but we can't drag them to there yet. But that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to drag them into there and have them appear in there. Um, so what we do now is we use the drag and drop API that's in HTML5. The drag and drop API in HTML5 is actually uh, a reverse engineering of IE's drag and drop API. Um, it's not the simplest of APIs, uh, as you'll see, um, but it has the advantage of working in IE, um, <laughs> which probably wouldn't be the case if we made up our own. Um, so let's see, to, to make it possible to drag the images, uh, we'll have to create some script which uh, does some of the common things here. Uh, so we'll have a function called drag, which we'll invoke from uh, the images. Um, and it needs uh, an element that's being dragged, the target, and it needs the event. And what it does, what it will simply do is take a data transfer object, which is found on the event, and set data is to actually say, what am I dragging? And we'll say that we are dragging some text, and we'll drag the actual ID of the, um, of the image. And when we just call this from each image by calling the, um, the method like that. There we go. OK, so now that will make things draggable, but it won't make things droppable. To make them droppable, we need to make these drop targets do something. Uh, and so we need a similar function, which is drop. And then uh, drop is similar. It'll take the element that you're dropping into and the event. Um, and the, uh, let's see, what we want to do is actually drop the target into, uh, drop the uh, thing being dragged into the div. Uh, so we want to append child the image onto the div. The div is a target here. Um, and we have its ID. We got its ID from um, from the event uh, because we put it into the event when we drag using set data. And so we can use get data to get the text back out, and that should give us an ID. And then we can just use document get and by ID to get the actual um, image. So that should drop the image. Now the problem is that. When you're dragging an image, uh, like I showed earlier, browsers have default behavior, and we want to cancel that default behavior. And what we do is we call prevent default on the event itself to prevent the, uh, the event from firing. 
So, oh, and we also need to actually make hook this up to the divs, um, which we do by saying on drop drop uh, onto this with the event. Um, that makes it possible to drop. And then there's also two other things we have to add, and this is where I said things slightly more complicated than they need to be. Um, we have to make it so that when you drag into a div, the div says, yes, I can take it. And when you stay dragging over the div, uh, the div says, yes, copying to here or moving to here is fine. Um, and there's two very simple ways of doing that. Uh, oops, on drag. Enter is the one that says, you know, are you a drag target or not? And if you just cancel the event by returning false, then it'll say it is. And on drag over is the other one. Um, by default, if you don't return false from on drag over, it'll assume you can't. It'll assume it's a drag target, but assume there's nothing you can do with what you're dragging, uh, which is basically the same as saying it's not a drag target. Um, and but if you return false, false to this event, um, it'll it'll say yes, whatever the default behavior is moving in this case, uh, accept it. And so we can do the same thing to the other div. And so now if I type everything correctly, um, we should be able to drag images along. So let's see. Oh well, yes, I can start dragging, but that happened before. Can I drag into here? Ta-da. So we're saying, oh, it's spam is bad. And eggs are good. There we go. Um, so this works in Firefox. That was Firefox. Uh, it works in. WebKit or Safari. Uh, and if I did the incantations just right, it'll even work in IE. Yes. Ta -da. So drag and drop works in three browsers. Uh, drag and drop actually works in, uh, has worked in IE for a long time. And like I said, this is a, an IE API. Uh, and I think it's even worked in Safari for a long time because back when I was reverse engineering it a couple of years ago uh, for the spec, um, Safari already had an implementation, so it's probably already shit. Uh, like I said, all the builds I'm showing here are nightly builds, so I'm not saying any of this will actually work in today's released browsers. Um, all right, so let's see. Let's close all these files. The next demo, um, unless there are any questions on that. No. The next demo is uh, on hash change. This is one of the few things I have to demo, which is from HTML5, which only IE has implemented. Um, this is a, a very simple thing. Imagine you have a page that's um, got a bunch of fragment identifiers. Um, let's see. Let's see these two, for example. Uh, historically, Historically, there's been no way for the script to really know when you've clicked these. Uh, I mean, you could hook into every link, um, but that's kind of a pain. Um, so what we've added in HTML5 is on hash change. Um, let's call update on with that. Um, and then what on hash change does is it says something changed with the fragment identifier part the hash part, the part after the hash in the, in the current URL. Um, and so we can check, you know, if location, dot, well, we, don't, we, know, we know that there's a hash. Uh, let's see, we can get the, um, uh, the um, the hash, sorry. Um, location dot hash dot substring one, there we go. Um, Oh, we do have to check to see the, the location. Ooh, yes, I did. Good call. Thank you. Um, so if location.hash, that means if there is a, a fragment identifier, uh, then we get the uh, actual value of it. Uh, and then we can set it. So let's say we had a, 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 an element here. ID equals message. Um, we could say document dot get element by id message dot uh, first child dot data equals message. Uh, so now when we reload this in theory, if I click on things, there we go. As we're clicking on the links, hash change is firing and it's changing the uh, the text. Um, 
you can also conveniently just call this on, on load. Um, and that way, if someone bookmarks this and then comes back to it later or changes the URL themselves, it will also work. Um, you know, so they can type, say they bookmark something else, and your script can know straight away. Um, and that'll still work with clicking on the links here. So that's useful for um, making web apps that uh, have links that don't, you know, you don't have to hook into the script all over the UI. You can just hook in uh, when you click the link. Uh, and like I said, that works in IE today. It doesn't work in other browsers, although it's relatively simple to implement, so who knows. Um, let's see. One of my uh, final demos here is going to be widgets. Uh, one of the first things we did with HTML5 is introduce a whole stack of uh, new form controls. Uh, and then we scale way back because adding too much stuff at once confuses the uh, browser vendors. Um, but uh, a lot of them survived anyway. Input type equals range, for example. Um, let's see. There you go. A range control in HTML. Um, Works in Opera too. Um, <laughs> hmm? um, right now, they're not so much. Um, the question was how stylable are, stylable are they? Um, one thing that we haven't yet looked at in HTML5, which is one of the things I've been pushing off because it's really kind of awkward and complicated, is how to style form controls in general. Um, and you know, as everyone here knows, the form controls in general, are st you know, the stylability is an issue. Um, it's something that will be looked at, and we we definitely wanted to find some things. Like you'll notice, both of the form controls in, in Safari and Opera have roughly the same size, not quite, but roughly. Um, <laughs> the idea is that on the long term, we'll, or in medium term, even, we'll, we'll stabilize on you know, okay, you can render it according to your whatever your platform is, but at least have it like these dimensions. If you respond to this particular CSS, at least respond in, you know, to this one and this one and this one and stuff like that. Uh, and we want to do that for all the form controls. Uh, right now, I mean, one, one of the big problems that um, browsers have is when you put an input type equals text control, um, there's a really weird algorithm you have to use to work out how to map from the size attribute, which is number of characters, to the actual width in pixels. Uh, and it involves like working out the average width of the current font and then multiplying by a particular factor and all kinds of weird stuff. And this is all because you know Netscape 4 or even earlier had uh, some weird algorithm and then Internet Explorer reverse engineered it because they needed it to, to be compatible and then it's like gotten worse. And with every generation, the algorithm changes slightly because the reverse engineering was slightly wrong and so it gets slightly more complicated and there's more edge cases. And then you find another page that depends on a previous version and so you end up with these really complicated things. And we do want to specify all that and actually say exactly what the algorithm should be um, but yeah, that's one of the things that um, has been delayed because it's hard and not cr not as critical as some of the rest of the stuff. Um, right. So, what can you do with the range control? Say we had uh, uh, a div element down here. Uh, we could say on input on the range control, uh, and then we can get the Get elements by tag name, get the div, and then change its uh, font size, say. Oop, we're getting near the end of the screen here. Uh, so now, um, Let's see, we can also um, do something like we could change uh, the contents. And so instead of changing the font size, we could say HTML5 will be ready in. And then we could have like a span element. Um, and then here we could change this to be a span element. And then use text content from DOM3. And then value. These dates are kind of low. Um, 
We can change that though. We have several new attributes here. So now it's got a much more sensible range. There we go. Um, and then this will work in uh, Opera as well. Uh, um, yeah. um, now the script here is kind of a pain. Uh, the the document.get elements by tag name and all that nonsense. Um, so uh, you remember I mentioned earlier about forms and how you've got much more convenient access to things in forms. Um, you can use this uh, by, instead of using a span, if we put everything in a form, we can use the new output element, uh, which basically works a little like an input element, except it's for output. Um, and then instead of all this nonsense, we can just say year. And we don't need to use text content. We just use value for consistency with the other controls, uh, although text content will work as well. And now, yay, it still works. Much simpler script. Um, Uh, lazy people are the main target audiences of the output element. Um, <laughs> it actually, I mean, part of, part of the reason is it helps, uh, like on the page, you can, might have span elements for all numbers of reasons. Um, but if you come across an output element, you know that is where you're putting data. Uh, output also has a for attribute, which lets you say that this output control is for this, this, and this. So like if you have you know, a bunch of numbers and you're t adding them up and they end up here, uh, you can say this output is for these numbers. And then uh, in theory, and I don't know that there's any plans to necessarily implement this anytime soon, but in theory, uh, accessibility tools can say, oh, this output element is for those. If you're looking at this number, maybe you want to have a look at what the numbers are actually uh, relating to, and it can point you straight up to there. Yes? Is that taken from web uh, Yes. Yeah, so a lot of the, so the question was, is this taken from web forms? All of the things I'm demoing right now with the widgets and all that are all part of web forms 2 originally. Uh, web forms 2 is being merged into HTML5 as we speak. <laughs> Uh, well, not as we speak right now, because I'm the one doing it. But um, before <laughs> this talk and after this talk, uh, <laughs> being merged into HTML5. Um, so let's see. Uh, what we're doing here is we're showing a date, right? So it's not the same, you know, um, same span. Otherwise, like, you're styling it and all the rest of it. So the question is whether output's the same as span. From a styling CSS point of view, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, from a DOM point of view, it has a whole bunch of APIs. Um, like dot value, so you can easily use it from forms. And it fits into the forms list, uh, as I just demonstrated. Uh, but yeah, from a starting point of view, it's basically the same span. Um, so, right, so what we're doing here is we're setting a date. Uh, so instead of input type equals range, what we really should do is input type equals date. Ta da! It's really, really <laughs> ugly. <laughs> I apologize, it's very ugly, um, and only Opera implements this right now, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, so we can set a date, and then, you know, there we go, it's ready. It's ready today? No, not ready next week. Um, we can also, um, uh, we can also use, if you want to get the actual date, we can use value as date. Uh, value as date will return the value attribute parsed into an actual date object. Uh, and so you can then do things like get year, so that instead of giving the exact date, we're back to giving a year. Um, there you go. Um, another control um, is, uh, I heard color. Um, several people have asked for a color control, and it is something that I've considered. However, if you look at actual color widgets, they are so incredibly complicated and varied that it's not really clear what we should do. Um, I, I have considered doing a color control uh, that is defined to be basically the Mac OS X color control, where all you have is a button with a color. And then you click the button, and everything that happens from that point on is up to the browser. Because um, you know this is like way the heck too much to put in spec. Um, and so that, that might happen. We might add something like that. Uh, right now, that isn't in there. Uh, there's a few other things that are in there. One thing that's not in there, for example, is a location um, aware input control. Uh, that actually was in a very early draft. Um, and so, you know, for example, if you had a GPS device, we could automatically hook it up with that. Privacy concerns and all kinds of concerns with that. Um, yeah, like I said, originally we had a lot of controls and it scaled back a lot. Um, but color is certainly 
top of the list of things that people have asked for that isn't, uh, aren't currently in there. Um, I see one of the things that is in there. Um, oops, is uh, URL and email fields. And these are quite common. If you're ever commenting on blog posts, you'll see that this is a very common thing. Um, so for example, you can type uh, URLs here. And if, there you go. If I type in a URL that is already there, um, Opera will, auto, will allow me to autocomplete straight from uh, my browsing history. Uh, and similarly, if I had email accounts, I believe it would autocomplete uh, on email here. Um, we can style the controls using CSS. Uh, the, the I'm not going to talk about exactly how you change their looks, but I am going to talk about uh, a pseudo class invalid, um, which you can use, but you can, be, you can give it like color. Um, so now, if I reload this and I start typing here, it goes red because this isn't a valid email address. If I type a valid email address, as soon as I type a valid, it'll, it'll stop being uh, it'll stop being red. Um, similarly, um, you know, the URL field would be the same. If you type in an invalid one, it's as soon as it's a valid URL, it'll switch to. So to find out if it's invalid, query this invalid. Uh, you don't need to do anything. Uh, that's the market. Um, Oh, if you actually want to find if it, so yeah, there is an API uh, input.validity, I believe. Um, yeah, input.validity.valid or something like that. And you can find out what's wrong with it, find out if it's too long or if it's the wrong type or if it's missing when it's required. I'll show that in a second. Um, yeah, there, there's a whole API for, for hooking into that. Uh, you can also say that it's invalid. There's a way you can set a string. And if you set the string to a non-null value, that means that the control is invalid in some custom defined way. Um, and then that string is what will be shown to the user if the user is told that the form is invalid. Um, let's see. Uh, we can also do. Hmm? Yes. Um, how does it, how does it uh, validate the email addresses? Um, it's just checking to make sure the syntax is right. Uh, comments are explicitly, the question is whether uh, the email field will check um, the value according to the RFC. And the answer is yes, except for comments. Um, because, yeah, comments are just completely ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I looked at the RFC, I was like, oh, wait, whoa, what the heck is this? Um, so, yeah, comments are, comments are excluded. But uh, I think it's, I, I'd need to look at the spec, but yeah, it is defined in terms of the RFC, and it's like this production, except with this change to get rid of comments. Um, all right, let's see. There's, there's a couple of more things. Uh, one is combo boxes. Um, so you, someone wanted a color picker. I'm afraid I can't give you a color picker, but I can give you a combo control. Um, four colors. Uh, so this is just a normal text input control, except we've given a list attribute, which will then connect to a data list element. And a data list element just takes a series of option elements, just like a select element would. Um, so then if I reload this, favorite color, it's just normal text control, but if I type it, uh, we'll bring up the list. Uh, and I can say something that isn't in the list, um, but if I want, I can also pick something that is in the list. Um, Let's see. I can also mark things as uh, required, uh, which is partly what was being discussed earlier. So if I say uh, input required, um, now I have a text control. And it's red straight away, you'll notice, because of the star sheet at the top saying, if it's invalid, make it red. And it's invalid because it's a required control and I haven't typed anything. If I type something, it turns, uh, it turns uh, back to white. Um, if I submit this, so say I had a, like a search page. Mismatch bracket. 
Oop, good catch, thanks. All right, <clears throat> so if I do this, let's get rid of the red. Nice to have uh, intelligent uh, error correction. Yeah, it's, uh, it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> so if I type in something here, now if I submit it without typing anything in, it should warn me about it. There you go. You have to specify value. And there's no scripting to do that. That's all the browser doing it itself. Um, and we have that for various other things, like if you put in a date, and you can set bounds on the date. And if you set the date to the wrong, to something out of bounds, it will complain about that. And you can set, give a pattern. And if you give the wrong pattern, it will complain about that. Um, let's see. Um, oh, something else. Uh, if instead of required, uh, I can put if, say, say, say I load this page. Um, notice how the field isn't focused. Now, if you go to Google.com, you'll notice the field is focused straight away. And we can do that without scripting too now using the autofocus attribute. So if we read the page, boom, focused. Um, and that means that. Um, in a scripting environment, if you just focus the control straight away, you would have you know, annoying things like if the user was starting to type in another control, and then the page loaded, and it moves focus, and then the user starts typing all over the place. Um, like they're typing their password in the password field, and it focuses the username, and they type their password, the, and so forth. So with this, the browser is the one doing the focusing. And so the browser can know, OK, the user has already started typing somewhere else. I ain't touching the focus. Um, or the, the user can just say, never touch the focus, and the browser can be, OK, I'm autofocus, sure, but I'm not going to do it. Um, and so that's, that's uh, uh, one, of the, um, one of the other added things with widgets. Uh, now, uh, let's move off on from widgets to a canvas, which is the final thing uh, that I want to show. Um, let's see, what did I call my canvas thing? Color, maybe. Um, so, Canvas is kind of a poster child because it was the most complicated um, of the early implemented APIs, was the most widely implemented given its complexity. Um, it has a lot of different features and Oddly enough, they're implemented so fast that people keep coming back to me and saying, can we add this feature to Canvas? Can we add this feature to Canvas? And it's not just like random people asking me this. It's the actual browser implementers themselves, um, which are kind of hard to say no to, because if you say no, they'll just go and invent their own version of it. Um, but uh, I've been trying to discourage too many additions to this, because I fear that it may be distracting um, from implementing other parts of HTML5. Uh, but anyway, so. This is how you get a graphics context. Uh, you get the canvas element. That's this part here. Uh, that just grabs the first canvas element. And then you call get context, and you pass it the kind of context you want, 2D being the only one that's uh, currently specified. Um, and the canvas element is up here, and we give it a width and a, width and a height. Um, and the width and the height isn't necessarily the rendered width and height. It's the uh, coordinate system's width and height. Although, by default, they're the same, so that you don't go insane trying to work out what's going on. Um, so let's create a path. We call begin path, and then we call move to. Um, let's see if we can get the canvas back from the thing. So, so this is moving to a random point on the canvas. Uh, and then we can do the same again, except instead of move to, we can use line to. And then we can just stroke the line. And that will, let's see, color, color, there you go, random line. Uh, very cool, right? Um, <laughs> we can make it slightly more cool by sticking this in the function and then just calling the function a lot. Um, There we go, lots of lines. Um, well, that's all very well, but if we have too many of these lines, eventually they'll just fill up with black. So what we should do is create a, uh, a similar uh, function to blank out the whole thing. Um, let's see, we'll do context dot 
uh, fill style. Fill style is how you set the uh, color of filled shapes, like rectangles or circles. Uh, and then we can use RGBA values to give a color. And this, these, the syntax of the fill style attribute is actually the same as CSS colors. So uh, it'll be familiar to um, people who have used CSS a lot. So I mean, for example, you can use the hash thing if you want an opaque color. If you want a, a transparent color like we do here, we want use RGBA. And then the fourth value here is 0 0.1 is the opacity. Um, and then we can use context.fillRect, and this is just a convenience method that creates a path that goes all around uh, your rectangle and fills it uh, with the fill style. Um, there we go. And then, I'll uh, blank this out a bit more often. There we go. Oh, no, now our color's wrong for the lines. Um, so what we can do is change the color up here context dot stroke style equals white. There we go. Uh, now the lines are kind of fading out. Um, we could also make things more interesting by changing the line width. Uh, let's see. Let's come up with kind of a 5 to 15 line width. There we go. Um, <laughs> this is going over way better than I expected from the couch here. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Uh, what we can do instead of straight lines is we can use um, we can use Bezier curves. Um, so let's, let's see. Oops. So we want to move to something, and then we want to Bezier curve to uh, a random point with two random control points. There we go. Um, um, it's like a sprint commercial. <laughs> um, we can also, we, so we could jo join the lines together if we remember the last X. Uh, so here we started with, started with this as an X, and then the last Y, started with this as a Y. And then just move to the last x and y, last x, last y, and then f create two new x and y's. Um, and then let's see, we want to change the last two points. The two, the two, the first two points. So this is uh, six numbers. The first two are the first two control points. The second two are the so the first two is the first control point. Second two are the second is the second control point, and the third one is the final point of the uh, Bezier curve. Um, so we can do that. And now, if we reload the line, it will be connected. There we go. Which is kind of nice. Um, no, no, that's the wrong way to color. All right. <laughs> are you reading the? Next thing on my script is to randomize the color, so I am wow. pretty happy with that. Um, so let's see. We could uh, start with. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, HSL colors, hue, saturation, lightness colors, uh, which allows us to uh, change the color without changing the brightness and the darkness. Um, so let's see. So each time we're going to make the hue uh, increase by. Uh, let's see, the, the range of hue is from 0 to 360. So here we're increasing it by 0 to 10 each time. Um, it wraps around. Yeah, it wraps around. So we don't have to worry about things like that. And then uh, let's see, context.stroke style. And we can remove the old stroke style of white up here and make it HSL. There's an HSL A as well if you want. Uh, and then we just stick in the hue here. And then 50%. Uh, S, 50% L. There we go. Uh, let's see if that worked. Whee. Um, now, it kind of goes near the edge, and I kind of want it like more inside, so it's kind of a border. And we could just stick a CSS border on there, but that wouldn't actually help me demonstrate the uh, canvas features. So instead, I'm going to use uh, transforms. So if we save and then restore, save and restore. Uh, save the current state of the canvas. And the reason I want to do that is because I'm going to change the uh, transformation matrix um, 
And if I don't restore it when I'm done, then the next time I change the transformation matrix, um, it'll just keep commutative. Uh, and the reason you have to putting it back is because while we're doing the line, we're still doing the blank. Uh, and so if we change the transformation matrix for the line and then don't change it back, well, the black overlaying box is going to be indifferent as well. And the next time it'll be different as well, and it'll just keep being different. Um, so let's see, context.translate is how you do a translation. Uh, and we want to translate it by, uh, let's see, about 90% of the, uh, no, we want to translate to the center first. So that's that. Uh, and then we want to scale it, scale it by about 90%. And so that puts it, so that, that's now a box like slightly in the middle. But if we don't change the translation back, so all the lines are going to be offset by half of the size of the canvas. So we'll just move everything back after the scale. And now the lines shouldn't be as far out from the edge. There we go. Nicely inside. Um, and this works in multiple browsers. This is Safari. Um, works in Firefox. And it works in Opera. Um, it probably even works in release browser of these, although I haven't checked. Uh, and one, uh, one final thing we'll do for coolness value. Before we stroke it, uh, let's uh, add a shadow. Uh, yes, it does actually work in Chrome, too. I have Chrome up here. This is the only demo I have that works in Chrome. Uh, I haven't tested it in IE with that canvas. Yeah, it works in Chrome as well. That's four browsers. I think that's a record for this. No, no that's the, the record for the demo. I don't think it's the only one that does four. Anyway, um, we add a shadow color, and then we can add some blur. Um, and then it looks even cooler. There we go. Um, all right, so that's the last demo I have. I just wanted to mention uh, one more thing, which is that, um, so I mean, I've shown a whole new, a lot of new features. Um, I'm going to have to remove this from the screen, aren't I? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I showed a whole bunch of new features. One of the things that HTML5 removes uh, is all the presentational stuff, like the font element, like BG color, uh, all that stuff, um, and uh, with the intent of using CSS instead. and. Uh, Google has actually started using uh, HTML5. For example, if you look at our uh, privacy page, let's load this in Firefox. If you look at our privacy page, um, one of our big pages, um, <laughs> that's what HTML5 looks like. The doc type's really short. Uh, to announce the character set, you don't need to uh, use the whole HTTP equiv nonsense. You just have a very short thing. Uh, and the rest of it's basically just like HTML4, except you'll notice there's no font elements, there's nothing like that, uh, no BG color. Um, and so, uh, you know, this isn't the only page, the privacy policy itself is the same. Um, and to help you, if you want to write HTML5 today, um, which you wouldn't really be able to use the new features much unless you're experimenting, but you would be able to use the, you know, the lack of presentation and use CSS instead. Um, and, and to benefit from uh, the tightening up we've done in uh, defining validation, we've, we have a validator that uh, Henry, uh, one of our, um, one of the members of the community who's, I believe, working for Mozilla on this, um, has created a validator, html5.validator.nu, um, and there you go. Um, and that shows you that uh, we, we, you can benefit today from um, the, the, you know, the, this new syntax aspects of it, uh, even if you can't actually use any of the features. And there you go. So does that okay. mean that Google Docs on page is going to stop using the or? Uh, I have no idea what the plan is for our other pages. <laughs> but the more pages we have that use it, the better. <laughs> All right, any questions? Yeah, so we have a, a new feature. Um, Let's see. Uh, so if you create you know, an, an HTML page, um, you can say things like uh, data, uh, I don't know, like value equals whatever. 
Um, and that will validate. Um, so the, the intent of these attributes, you can, anything that starts with data, basically, you can do. Um, uh, the intent is that these attributes are used by script. Uh, so you know, Google Calendar, for example, could stick a data event ID attribute on every div that represents an event. Um, and then instead of having to hack around or use the title attribute or use you know, lots of things like that, um, you can just store the data on the element itself. I, there's not really any way to demo that because it doesn't do anything. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's why I didn't include it. Um, the browsers all support it in that they don't do anything with it, which is the whole point. Yes? Yeah, so the question is what um, uh, video format we should use in the video element. Uh, the, the demo I showed you was AUG, and uh, Firefox and Opera, well, Firefox supports AUG in their build. Uh, Opera has an experimental build uh, kind of off their main branch that uh, supports AUG. Um, Safari supports AUG in theory if you add the uh, codec for it. Uh, I didn't actually demo video in Safari here because for some reason, QuickTime in general is broke on my machine. Um, so I can't show it. Um, the problem right now is that there isn't any codec that satisfies everyone. Um, Apple doesn't really want to implement, my understanding is Apple doesn't want, I don't want to speak for them, but my understanding is they don't really want to implement AUG uh, because they don't know what the risk is with patents. Um, they've already taken the risk on things like H.264, and so that's not a new risk for them. But if they implement AUG, that's a whole new risk. And if you look at things like the LLS patent, like MP3 patent uh, lawsuits to Microsoft recently, um, it, it's kind of a scary space out there. You know, it's like multi-billion dollar um, awards and stuff like that. And it's like, whoa, you don't want to take risk that you don't need to. Um, it's also not really clear that AUG is actually that good of a format necessarily compared to, say, H.264. Um, but, you know, that's debated. Um, the long-term solution right now from HTML5's point of view is wait and see. We're not really sure what's going to happen. Uh, H.264, of course, is really great technical format, and you know, YouTube's using it, and Apple's using it, and lots of people are using it. It's all, all the handsets. The problem with that is it's not royalty-free, and so like Mozilla and Opera couldn't use it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a difficult space. We don't have a solution right now. It's, it's certainly something that's still being looked at. So the question is uh, about HD and whether we're allowed to choose a codec. So in, in the video element, uh, you can specify multiple video files. Uh, there's a source element that goes. Uh, I, I just showed you the source attribute, but you can put a source element as a child of the video element, and you can list you know, one source element per video. Um, and you can give a, a type attribute and a media attribute on that. Uh, the type says what kind of codec it is and that stuff. Uh, and the media says. Uh, you know, this is intended for big screens or small screens or color screens or black and white screens or printers. Um, okay, maybe not printers. Um, but the, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the situation in theory is that the, browser, the browsers can then work out which one is best. We don't really want to go there. I mean, we don't, that might work for HD versus standard def because you can then just produce too easily. We don't really want to go there for multiple... Um, video codecs, because that just becomes a pain. I mean, you can imagine, you know, YouTube has a whole library in, you know, H.264, and we don't want to re-encode the whole thing as a whole new um, format, and it takes a lot of disk space and so forth. I mean, it's, it's expensive. So it, it's something that, uh, and that's just not just YouTube. I mean, that's any video site. We don't really want to have to require that from people. But the problem is we don't have a solution right now. So, Any other questions? Yes. Um, so the way this, the question is whether there's keyboard access for drag and drop. Um, the way the spec defines drag and drop is actually very generic. Uh, well, it's, it's very specific to like what events should fire and when, but it doesn't say what the user interaction should be. It doesn't say anywhere that the mouse is how you do drag and drop. Um, so that ends up being mostly an issue up for uh, the browser vendors. Uh, in particular, the spec defines copy and paste in terms of drag and drop. Um, when you start a copy, what you're conceptually doing in the spec is you're dragging to an off-screen location. And then when you paste, you're dragging from an off-screen location. 
Uh, and so the same events fire in theory for drag and drop as copy, copy and paste. Uh, that isn't implemented anywhere yet. Um, and maybe it'll change if no one implements it. But uh, that goes some way towards making drag and drop somewhat more um, keyboard friendly. The question is how much are we inspired by Flex and other things. Um, a lot of the work actually started because we were really scared of Silverlight, or what used to be called Avalon at the time. Um, and uh, Flex, not so much. I mean, I haven't really looked much at Flex. Uh, but you know, we look at a lot of things. We look at things like Win32. Uh, we look at you know, GTK and other desktop level APIs. Um, a lot of web forms, too, the, the widget stuff I showed you, uh, a lot of that was actually inspired by uh, Xforms. Uh, Xforms is a, a W3C technology that is really good for forms. Like, if you want to do a tax form or whatever, it's really great. Uh, the problem is it's not compatible with HTML, so you can't really just add it to an HTML page. You have to, you know, boil the ocean, as people say, and start a whole new page. Um, and so we, we took a lot of ideas from there. Um, it's not clear that necessarily all those ideas were good. In fact, we're cutting quite a lot of them. Um, but, you know, that's a separate problem. Um, and yeah, we're, we're taking features from ideas from anywhere we can, we can see. Um, prioritization is the biggest issue. I mean, there's like an infinite number of <laughs> things we can copy, but we have to, have to figure out what browsers are willing to implement. So the question is, uh, the, given that HTML5 is a, a lot designed with laziness in mind, and given how a lot of web authoring is moving towards automated tools, how does that affect um, our concerns? Um, pretty much all of the automated tools are handwritten at some point. Um, I mean, all, like a WordPress template is written by hand. Um, you know, Dreamweaver's output, there's some guy at some point had to work out what the output should be and wrote it. Uh, and so you know, a, a lot of the... Uh, concerns about whether it's handwritten or not end up, they will basically end up being handwritten at some point. Um, also, there's, I mean, there is a lot of generated content. That's certainly true. I mean, you know, like Wikipedia is almost all generated. There's nobody writing the HTML for that, um, except for the template. But uh, on the other hand, there's still a lot of handwritten HTML. Um, and so, you know, we have to balance the two. Uh, the, I don't can't really think of any features offhand that are specifically designed for generating content, but I mean it's certainly not something that we would uh, dismiss. Yes. So, uh, what's the future of XHTML with regard to HTML5? Um, so the question is, what's the future of XHTML with regard to HTML5? There are several answers to that. I will give you several of them. Um, the first answer is from HTML5 perspective. Uh, HTML5 doesn't care. Um, by which I mean HTML5, the spec defines both XHTML5 and HTML5. Uh, and we just call it HTML5 because that's the name that's stuck, um, the spec, I mean. The, the, um, uh, the XHTML5 variant is literally just the same language, but serialized to XML. And the HTML5 variant is literally just the same language again, but serialized to text slash HTML. Um, and we, in HTML5, that's a new syntax. It's not SGML like it used to be. Uh, because in practice it never really was, except in validators. Um, and so we have our, you know, we define the parser. And one thing I didn't demonstrate um, is there is a really detailed parser spec now, and there are a number of implementations of the parser, except not in browsers. Um, I think there's one browser for Risk OS that implements the HTML5 parser, but let's face it, that's not a high. I mean, I, all, I've got a lot of respect for the guys who work on that, and they're our, you know, part of our community, but it's not a big um, market share. Um, but, the, uh, but there are a number of libraries that implement that parser. Um, so uh, we basically we look at it as three languages. We look at it as DOM5 HTML and XHTML5 and HTML5. And they're all kind of like, they, you can go from one to the other in different ways and 
there are things you can't describe in one, you can't describe in another. So from HTML5's point of view, there's no difference. Uh, from the W3C's point of view, or rather from the XHTML2 working group's point of view, um, I'm not completely clear on what their stance is. My understanding is that they're still working on XHTML1.x, uh, and they're certainly still working on XHTML2. Um, and XHTML2, as far as I understand it, is not compatible with HTML4 uh, or 5. Um, it's not a tech slash HTML markup language, uh, although they might allow you to send it as my, that MIME type. I'm not entirely sure. Um, so yeah, from that point of view, that it's somewhat less clear what exactly what's going on. Uh, from the point of view of browser vendors, uh, who I've spoken to at least, um, very few people are using XHTML, and so it's not a high priority, uh, by which I mean the XML variant of any HTML language. Um, one of the problems with XHTML2 is it's unclear whether it will use the same namespace or a different namespace as HTML5. If it uses the same namespace, browsers simply won't implement it because it's a different, they, they have overlapping tag names, but they have different behavior. So you can't implement both. Uh, if it's a different namespace, they might or might not implement it. I haven't heard anyone say that in the major browsers, at least, that they're planning on it. So the question is whether there's a table that lists the, current, the, the features and when browsers are expected to implement them. Uh, there isn't one that does exactly that. There's no, there's no table that lists planned dates, mostly because the browser vendors are very bad at planning when they're at least telling anyone. Um, I don't know. They might have great timetables internally. They just <laughs> don't tell anyone. Um, and, and also because any planning that does occur is on a pretty short-term basis. I mean, it's a matter of months. It's not a matter of years. Um, the... Opposite question, if there's a table anywhere that describes what is currently implemented, is easier to, uh, exp is easier to answer. Uh, if you look in the HTML5 spec itself, um, you will notice um, on the side here, let's see, there we go. Um, there's these little boxes every now and then that say things like last call for comments, and they have little icons which right here are not at all lit up, but in some cases, some of them are lit up. Um, let's see, if we look for canvas, it should be lit up. There you go, there's some lit up here. Um, so this tells you, for that particular section, what the status is. So that means that Firefox has uh, a pretty good implementation because it's not fully opaque, but it's not completely disappeared. Uh, IE is the first icon. So uh, that means IE's implementation is non-existent. Um, and so this box appears in various places in the spec. Um, it's not completely up to date. Uh, it's, it's publicly editable. So if you want to edit it, just let me know, and you can have access to edit it. Uh, if someone wants to volunteer to update it, that'd be great. Um, there's also a wiki page on the What, we, what Working Group wiki. Um, ah, wiki .workgroup.rc. Um, not exactly sure where this is. But there's a wiki page anyway on the, on the What Working Group wiki that says um, oh, there you go, implementations. Um, that says where things vaguely stand. And again, that page isn't exactly the most up-to-date. Um, so, you know, there you go, various things. Uh, tells you cross-document messaging is implemented in Opera 9, Safari, and Firefox 3, and IE8. Um, the real answer is that it doesn't re I mean, unless you're willing to write separate code for um, well, so there's basically three ways of using HTML5 features right now. You can use, um, you can not use them. That's one option. You can, um, and that's the one that will work the best uh, right now. There's the option of uh, using them and then doing browser detection or feature detection to detect whether the browser supports it and then falling back on something else. And then for some of the features, they're basically designed so that you can have automatic fallback. Um, so, for example, uh, the, the date control, um, if you create an input type equals date control, so if we do input type equals date, um, and we open this in Opera, where input type equals date is supported, uh, oops, one. Um, it'll show up as a date control. But if you open this in a different browser, like WebKit, it'll appear as a text control. Um, and so, and you, it'll still submit the text control, uh, and then your server can do server-side validation of the date and say, whoa, that's not a date, and then send it back. 
Um, so I mean, it's not great fallback, but it's kind of a fallback. Um, and a lot of the features are that way. I mean, for, for example, Canvas, if you don't support Canvas, then whatever you type inside the Canvas will appear. So if we do, um, you know, can, Canvas, blah, 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 Canvas, um, if you load it in WebKit, it won't show anything because there is a, there is Canvas support. But if you load it in IE, where there's no Canvas support, it should say no support. There you go. Um, and so that, that you can do things like preparing the fallback behavior in that sense. Uh, I wouldn't recommend using HTML5. I mean, the title of this talk was HTML5 features that you can't use or something like that. Um, and, and it's because this is still very early days. Uh, and if you want to use HTML5 features, you're probably better off either picking something that specifically works in a lot of browsers today and saying to your users that you have to use a modern browser, like post message might be might be viable to do that in post message in a, in a few months. Um, or just say you're not going to use it until it's much more widely deployed. No more questions? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>